Forests are often referred to as the lungs of the earth, which isn't surprising since they are essential for the health and well-being of the planet. But as we know, our forests are facing multiple threats brought on by over-exploitation and global warming. Welcome to this new edition of Eco Africa. I am Chris Alems, coming to you from Lagos. And I am Sandra Kahomza Twinobdio, right here in Kampala, Uganda. Yes, indeed, Chris. In order to secure our future, we really must make safeguarding all valuable ecosystems a priority. And fortunately for all of us, efforts are being made to do just that. So do stay tuned because we'll be looking at a few of them today. And here is what else we've got coming up. Meet a Congolese activist who is convincing people to preserve trees. Here, how floods can be used to dye textiles. And learn why a diverse forest is a strong forest. Here on Eco Africa, we've had many reports on wildlife poaching and species trafficking. And while they are recognized crimes in most places, who makes sure the offenders are punished? Well, right here in Kampala, a special court brings perpetrators to justice. It is the first in Africa dedicated to wildlife crime, and we meet the inspiring woman who heads it. No, oh, oh. The last southern white rhino to roam free in Uganda was killed by poachers in 1983. This huge but docile animal can live to be 45 years old. But here it was hunted out of existence by people wanting to sell its horn illegally. The killers rarely face justice. Gladys Kamasanyu from Africa's first special wildlife court wants to change all that. An animal who is a victim in a wildlife case does not have a chance to report that wrongful act that has been occasioned to them even when say they are survivors they don't have a chance to report they don't have a chance to follow up on their case they don't have a chance to appear in court to tell their story to show us their pain like where a human being is the victim with Gladys Kamasanyu speaking up for them, these animals have a powerful ally. The chief magistrate often visits this wildlife sanctuary outside Kampala to get first-hand information about ongoing poaching, which is often linked to international crime. Ekeara describes the fate of parrots that were recently rescued from traffickers. Some of them uh, have lost their primary feather, they can no longer fry. Others have broken limbs. Others are in excruciating pain. To be quite honest, I think uh, uh, justice must be dispensed on behalf of these animals. Since Uganda's wildlife court was established in 2017 in Kampala, Judge Kamasanyo has dispensed justice in more than 1,000 cases. The longer it goes on, the more Kamasanyo is determined to help curb illegal wildlife trade. I realized how much depletion is going on. The losses that are out there, I keep waking up and I get to know, oh, there's a big role as a judicial officer that I really have to play to save nature. Not for me today, but all those who come after me. The Mokamasanyu is determined to help curb illegal wildlife trade. About 11% of Ugandan territory is in legally protected conservation areas. Encroaching on the natural resources, harming or killing any of the animals is punishable by laws that were toughened in recent years. But it's not always enough. Between 2021 and 2022, there were almost 3,000 documented cases. Even elephants are speared using this kind of spears, the buffaloes, the hippos. And uh, when you look at the people who uh, uses the spears, some of them can throw these spears 
a distance of 30, 40 meters, and for you, you, will, you can't even throw it a distance of five meters. And these are old people who have been in the poaching uh, activities right from childhood. This man was arrested after killing a buffalo with a spear. Such cases used to face delays in the ordinary legal system and rarely resulted in stiff sentences. But wildlife crimes now get special attention in Kamasa News Court. In a landmark case in 2022, she sent a repeat offender of ivory trafficking to life in prison. The judgment was widely welcomed by conservationists. We started seeing uh, some prosecution being taken seriously because now this is a special court. We are bringing suspects from all over the country. And so we started getting deterrent sentences. People who would want to commit crime when they know that once you commit this crime, you will be taken to Kampala. There is a special court and you can be given a harsh punishment. So I think to me that was a very good uh, thing. Kamasanyu feels that some suspects presented to her court don't understand the importance of conservation and protecting endangered species. So beyond her judicial role, she has founded a non-profit organization to educate communities, especially the young generation. The little ones can be groomed to be the future conservationists, those who conserve the environment, nature, take care of the animals that today we are laboring to take care of. And if we left them, for example, and we didn't care to catch them young, they can as well become the, the future poachers. Thanks to conservation efforts, there are now more than 30 white rhinos in Uganda. Judge Kamasanyu hopes other countries will soon center the rights of animals when dealing with poaching and trafficking. Then creatures like the southern white rhino may once again live long lives in freedom. What a wonderful example of how one person can really make a difference. We head now to the Democratic Republic of Congo to meet someone else who is currently dedicating his life to protecting the natural world. Yes, and under very difficult conditions, for decades, the city of Goma has been plagued by war and crisis, and it's far from over. And yet, it's right there that we found a man who remains committed to environmental protection, despite the odds. It doesn't take Joseph Songo long to attract a crowd here. The northern part of the Goma refugee camp is home to over half a million internally displaced people. Many have lost everything, which Songo has in mind when he explains how important nature is to their well-being. Most of these people can't read or write. But it's very important that everyone who is struggling with hardship understands these problems and knows how to respond, how to make good decisions. If they understand environmental issues and the role of trees, then they can change their behavior. The biggest threat to the environment in the region is deforestation. Some 1,500 trees are felled here every day. The refugees mainly use the wood to cook with. Almost no one here has work, nor do they receive any state benefits. Some of them make a modest living producing charcoal out of wood. What you see behind me is a fire where wood is being burned and turned into charcoal. But there's a risk that we end up with poor air quality because there aren't enough trees purifying the air and producing oxygen. Logging is a problem not just in Goma but across the country. According to the NGO Global Forest Watch, some 475,000 hectares of primary forest were lost in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2019 alone. For several years in a row, the DRC has been losing more old-growth rainforest than any other country except for Brazil. The civil war and high numbers of internally displaced people exacerbate the problem. Last year, fighting once again flared up between the Congolese government forces and the M23 rebel group. About 5.7 million people have been displaced by the conflict. 
In January 2022, Joseph Songo was among those forced to flee his home. He's been in Goma ever since. His conservation work is not without risk because the rebels use the funds gained from illegal tree felling to finance their fight. They came to my house and vandalized it. They told everyone they were looking for me. I and many of the activists face a lot of security threats. It's because we're harming the interests of people who benefit from destroying the environment. But he's seen the devastating impact of deforestation. That is what drives him forward, despite the risks. He's managed to galvanize some 3,000 people, both locals and refugees, to plant trees in an effort to reverse the effects of deforestation. Farmer Mapendo Furaha is one of them. I've learned how important it is to protect trees. They play a crucial role in protecting the environment. Many people continue to fell trees and don't plant new ones in their place. But I share what I've learned with others. I want them to realize how important it is to plant trees. We know that the future of our forests depends mainly on women. They're the ones who are in charge of our families. They keep everything going. Joseph Songo has his own garden where he grows a range of vegetables, including spinach. He's also planted an avocado tree. He does a little bit of work here every day. He's also committed to teaching his children about the environment. He uses art as a way of teaching them. Every day I give them a drawing exercise. I ask them to think of something to do with the environment, with nature. It helps them develop a mindset, a mental, social, and emotional capacity that will make them more likely to protect the environment when they grow up. Joseph Songo sees education as the key to ensuring the environment is protected. In this way, he hopes all those around him will get the message, including the next generation. The future of forest is a concern in France too. Trees there are struggling with higher temperatures and irregular rainfall, and experts say this will only get worse in the coming decades. But the authorities think they might have found a very simple way to help build up a forest resilience. Let's find out more. The oak tree on the right has hardly any leaves left and will soon die, while the one on the left is doing well, for the time being. Not a good sign. Here in the Moliere Massif, foresters are trying out a strategy to cope with the effects of climate change. This is what's called a mosaic forest, made up of all sorts of different trees, including birches, oaks, and Turkish pines. The mosaic forest is first and foremost a legacy of several silvicultural methods. We've seen regular high forest, irregular high forest, islands of old wood, islands of senescence and restored habitats. And it's also an alternation of landscapes and a mix of species. That's what we need to remember about the mosaic forest. It's a mixture of vegetation strata that boosts the resilience of the forests of today and above all of tomorrow. On 4,200 hectares of land, the French forestry agency, the Office National des Forêts, is trying out solutions to climate change. They're basing their experiments on a predicted temperature increase of 4 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Climate stress is like a silent storm, the experts say, causing as much damage as forest fires, and it's one that isn't stopping. They're diversifying the forest with conifers, deciduous trees, and southern tree species. They've planted sessile oaks, for example, which originated in southern France under mature oaks. 
This protects the small oaks in very hot, dry summers. The foresters use a net to collect acorns to be used in their program. They hope that the introduced species will hybridize with native oaks. The importance of the mosaic forest in relation to climate change is to always have one or more solutions, to avoid deadlock, and to continue to help the forest to adapt. We can see that climate change is happening very fast, and the forest's ability to adapt to the speed of climate change is limited. And that's where the forester's contribution is important, in helping the forest to adapt to climate change more quickly. The French foresters are pinning their hopes on a mosaic of tree species instead of a monoculture. It's more difficult to manage, but it's also more resilient to intensifying climate change. Stayed in Europe, we now head over to Austria's capital, where a lot of attention is also given to trees and other plants. It's time for the third part of our digital series about Vienna's new district designed to be future-proof. This week, we're going to find out why green spaces are such an important element in this forward-thinking urban city. City planners around the world should watch carefully. Half of Vienna's newly built district Aspen is made up of open streets, squares and parks. Planting trees could save thousands of lives. Trees reduce the effects of climate change, like heat, especially in urban areas. In the center is an artificial lake for people to swim in. The entire city slopes towards it, so that the rainwater will collect there. But even with all this planning, areas of heat still pop up during the summer. In the city square, the concrete was torn up and replaced by flowers, trees and misting stations to cool down people and the environment. Money coming in from selling land to private investors helps fund social housing and public parks in the neighborhood. And the residents do their fair share too with community gardens and planting flowers and greenery wherever they can. By 2050, it's estimated there will be 2.4 billion more people living in cities. This century could rightly be called the urban century. It's about time to make our cities ready for the future. Being prepared for the future is what sustainability is all about. From architecture in Europe, we now move to fashion in Africa, an industry that's also making an effort to clean up its acts. That is right, Chris. And I think you will be surprised to hear that plants and minerals can play a very important role here when combined with a big helping of creativity. Here is this week's Doing a Bit. Nimco Adam uses foodstuffs from the local market to dye her fabrics. Tea and coffee for brown tones, turmeric for a warm yellow. And this is passion fruit. Look at this beautiful colour. The Somali-born designer once worked for fast fashion companies using artificial dyes, until one day she lost her sense of smell. Now she runs her own firm in Kenya and only employs natural dyes. When I'm doing my production, this dye is very natural and normally I can test it. Nothing happens to me. I mean, I can uh, test. I don't get sick. The dyes don't harm her staff either or the environment. Nimco Adam is one of Africa's sustainable fashion pioneers. She's convinced synthetic dyes have no future on the continent. 
That is definitely a step in the right direction, especially knowing that textile production is responsible for around 20% of clean water pollution. What a waste. We need that water for many other things, like growing food. Our next report takes us to Morocco, a country that is ravaged by drought. But there too, they are finding ways to improve water efficiency. Morocco has to deal with the fact that it has less and less water. Agriculture is the North African country's most vital industry. That's why the country is now investing in cutting-edge irrigation systems. The World Bank is helping Morocco with hundreds of millions in loans. But is that really the solution? The Dukala region in the northwest is actually rich and fertile, but climate change has led to less rainfall. In our culture, we used to use irrigation techniques based on water canals. Now the canals don't work anymore, as too much water is wasted. With the help of modern techniques like drip irrigation, almost none is wasted. The World Bank initiated the project in the Dukala region in 2009. With the local irrigation program, the farmers have control over the irrigation process. The production process has intensified at the crop level and also at the productivity level. It's something tangible. There's an increase in yield, which farmers talk about a lot. It has that effect on all crops. With drip irrigation, the water seeps into the soil as close as possible to the roots of the plants. The project in Dukala is worth the equivalent of some $158 million. The farmers taking part in the project had to take out a low-interest loan. This technology is expensive, but it's worth it because it gives us large volume production. When we were still relying on traditional irrigation, the beet yield was 40 or 50 tonnes. After introducing drip irrigation, the yield reached 100 to 120 tonnes per hectare. Morocco is one of many countries that rely on artificial irrigation. In the countries marked in green, between 20 and 50 percent of farmland is irrigated. More than half of the areas in pink are irrigated, especially in Asia. Worldwide, 20% of farmland is artificially irrigated. This land produces 40% of the world's food. To maintain irrigation technology in the Middle East and North Africa, $17 billion have to be raised annually. Huge costs. Now, thanks to irrigation, farmers are growing other crops that use more water, which has prompted criticism. Agricultural projects in Morocco need to be reconsidered in general. We can't use up our basic water resources to grow crops for export, like watermelon and avocado, which are not staple foods. We need to grow the crops that contribute to our food security because the Middle East and North Africa region is especially threatened by hunger due to the Ukraine war. Mohamed Aldoblani had already gone abroad because his family's fields no longer yielded enough. But he then returned and bought more land, where he planted olive trees that used less water. Before drip irrigation was introduced, farming was traditional and people emigrated, as I had done, because the fields no longer produced a yield. The introduction of drip irrigation has helped convince many villagers to stay here and has motivated others to return and invest in land and their farms. And it's created a desire in our children to work in farming. Even with drip irrigation, agriculture remains Morocco's biggest water consumer. Groundwater supplies are becoming scarcer, 
So modern irrigation technology and the World Bank project are only temporary solutions for Morocco's farming industry. Finding ways to use water more efficiently, that's a topic we'll be thinking about a lot in the years to come. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the program. For now, I am Sandra Kahomza Twinobrio signing off from Kampala here in Uganda. Bye, Sandra. See you again next time. And to all of you viewers out there, do you have any thoughts or ideas or ways you think we can build a better future? Then share with us. We look forward to hearing from you. I'm Chris Lems signing out from Lagos, Nigeria. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.